Hello and welcome to another episode of Ed Choice Chats. This is our School Choice and Pop Culture series, and my name is Robert Enlow, and I'm the president and CEO of Ed Choice. I'm being joined by Abby Hayes. Abby Hayes, and you are our <laughs> I'm the CRM and email marketing manager. Basically, everything you get from us comes from Abby in many ways, and so we're really glad to have her. I'm really excited today because we're going to be doing one of my favorite things is talking about Harry Potter. <laughs> so clearly I'm a big nerd about this and also, I have to admit, I am a member of the Ravenclaw house, according to the website, even if I <laughs> wanted to be Gryffindor. So what, what house are you? I'm Ravenclaw, too. I'm rocking my Ravenclaw gear today. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Harry Potter and school choice, and there's a lot to talk about here. But we're going to start off with a clip. And of course, everyone who's ever seen Harry Potter in the world knows this clip. <laughs> it's at the beginning of the first book, and it's when Harry is coming into the Grand Hall, which, by the way, I'm sure all of you have visited in England like I have. Um, and he is coming to the hat, the sorting hat, as they call it, to see what house he's going to be sent to inside of Hogwarts. And so it's a very big scene that's going to set the stage for the rest of the books. And so I think we're going to start off showing that and then, uh, and then discuss that. All right. Ronald Weasley. Another Weasley. I know just what to do with you. Gryffindor! <laughs> Harry Potter? Difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind, either. There's talent, oh yes, and a thirst to prove yourself. But where to put you? Not Slytherin, not Slytherin. Not Slytherin, eh? Are you sure? You could be great, you know. It's all here, in your head. And Slytherin will help you on the way to greatness. There's no doubt about that. No? Please. Well, if you're sure, better be Gryffindor! <laughs> okay, so everyone who's watched The Sorting Hat, Right, has seen so much in there. So what strikes you first about that? I think there's so much there. <laughs> I said, actually, while we were watching it, when Ron gets sorted, there's sibling preference. Yes, that's right. So so we see that a lot in school applications. Oh, your your siblings are all here. That's where you go. Yeah, okay. so like, so the first thing about the sorting hat is Ron Weasley gets up there, and it's just like charter schools, right? Sibling preference. <laughs> it's allowed, right? In a charter school, you uh, are allowed to have siblings come in without having to go through the application or the lottery process. So. Yep. In a way, the Sorting Hat uh, exhibited sibling preference. I like that. <laughs> what else did you think about? Um, so I read an article recently about how Harry should have been a Slytherin, which I do not agree with. He could have been a Slytherin, but no, that would not have worked. Um, but one of the things that the commenters pointed out that I really liked was that the Sorting Hat seems to be sorting kids not based on who they are currently, but on who they want to become. And I kind of love that as an analogy for school choice. Like we as parents choose schools for our kids based on the values we want to instill in them. And it has to do with their learning style now, of course, but also here's what we're becoming, here's what we're working towards. And so it's that aspirational that. thing. I think that's yeah. really interesting. I, I think a couple yeah. things. One, one, of course Harry shouldn't have been in Slytherin because he was infused with, with Voldemort, and that's the only reason he would have had <laughs> Slytherin in him at all, uh, being being one of the, uh, the uh, I can never say that word, uh, uh, the horcrux, cru horcrux, 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 horcrux yes. word, and I hate that word. Um <laughs> The other thing that struck me over this whole thing is the trepidation, right, of the kids, yeah. right? So as you're going into school and you're a young kid and you're sort of approaching sort of where you're going to be, there's this whole sort of like, what do I do? How do I do? I'm a little mm -hmm. confused. I'm a little nervous. I'm a little worried. And, and sort of the instance of relief on people's uh, once they actually were sort of sorted in yes. a way it was very yes. interesting. Once the choice sure. had been made, there was a lot of sort of interesting 
reactions. Like some people, yep. were, I'm ready to go, and some people just, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, right. you've probably experienced that as a parent too. I know I have with picking a kindergarten last year, and there's all this angst about it, and then you get your decision, and it's like, all right, this is what we're doing. We're good now. Yeah, once that decision is made, and so yeah. so one could make the argument though is the sorting hat is is this benevolent dictator. Right? Sort of, sure. Right? It says where kids are going to go. Yeah. How do you respond to that? Well, we've talked about it as far as common enrollment, right? <laughs> I wasn't so, going to go there right off the I bat, know, but we can. I know. Well, obviously, it's taking their choices into account on Correct. some level, which good common enrollment systems do. But, you know, what algorithm is the is the sorting hat using? Like, how is it making its decisions? Is it always taking into account the – we don't have – we don't have records of anybody else's conversations with the sorting hat, especially in the book. Only Harry is the one who has that kind of in-depth, you know, I don't want to do this mm. with the sorting hat. And for those of you who don't know, common enrollment systems are systems where uh, the, uh, everyone's name is ostensibly, every family puts a list, uh, their name on a list for the schools that they want, and then an algorithm will sort their options for them, right, mm-hmm. and tell them what school they go to. Some cities have this, I think, in uh, Boston. Indianapolis, uh, Denver, and a few other cities have this this process. And New Orleans, I think. New Orleans as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It has this process. It's very interesting. Um, Harry. Let's get to Harry a little bit. Okay. So I think Harry is an interesting example of fighting the system. And, and, and how do you feel about that? Tell me what you mean by that. So, so Harry, the sorting hat is there telling t- maybe whether or not it's a common enrollment type system where it's, it's yeah. taking their choices into account. It doesn't look like that until you get to Harry, right? When, yeah. You know, so, so when you get to Harry, it's the first time where where you see someone as a kid look at that, have things to the hat, and say, "I don't want the choice you think you might give me." Yeah, yeah. And and so that may have been going on in the other ones, but right. it, it wasn't going we on until we saw it. that. They're not our main character. So Harry basically is saying to the system, you know, to heck with you. I think on some level, there's that. I think. I think a lot of what it is for Harry is that he already kind of feels like he belongs with these other other people that he's already made friends with because he's coming to this completely new situation. He doesn't even really know that much about Slytherin other than Draco's kind of mean like his cousin and Draco's obviously in Slytherin and says that he should be too because all of the good people are in Slytherin. So he kind of rejects that idea of he's experienced that snobbery at home because where before he found out about Hogwarts, this is not context for the movie but from the book. So before he finds out that he's going to Hogwarts, he lives with his aunt and uncle who obviously treat him horribly, right? And his cousin gets to go to this fancy, probably boarding school, private school, where he carries a cane because I don't know why, because it's England and people do crazy things like that. And so he's going there and Harry's going to go to, they're just like, oh, you're just going to the local public school and it's terrible and and whatever. So he's already kind of experienced that snobbery in his home life and he wants none of it. Of course, those of us across the pond in America don't don't have any <laughs> snobbery whatsoever. Um, I think it's really interesting that the, the the word you use, belonging. Mm. I really like that word because it, it, you know the sense of of education being about belonging and creating mm-hmm. a sense of belonging sure. at the school and with your peers and and I certainly think that happens in the Sorting Hat scene. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What what other instances in Harry Potter? So we're talking about the the Sorting Hat, but there's got to be all sorts of other school choice, you know, sort of parallels in in. Harry Potter's and the books and, and the movies. Well, what do you think of the other ones? Yeah, so when we've been batting ideas around the office, because there are a lot of Harry Potter nerds in our office, of course. So when we've been batting ideas around, we've talked about how there's actually kind of a profound lack of school choice for wizards. There's only, as far as we know, kind of one major school per region. Um, I'm curious about that and if that could be different or what that might look like if it were different, how you could take on kind of a new educational model for wizarding. Well, so there's certainly the distinction between a muggle and a wizard, right? So oh, yeah. muggles don't go to wizarding schools right. and wizards go to wizarding school. But there's some half, half-breeds, half right, right, as it were, as, as to use that terminology from the book, uh, uh, or the half-bloods. As Including it were, Hermione. Yeah, right. Including Hermione. Um, and, and they can go to, but not squibs, per se. Let's talk about that yeah, for a second. Yeah, squibs are kind of an interesting case. So if you know much about the movies or the books, Argus Filch, the caretaker who's in the Sorting Hat scene, he's a squib. He can't do magic, but he was born to a magical family. And then um, Harry's neighbor, what's her name? Oh, the... The lady know. with the yeah. cats. Yes. Uh, she is also a squib. Mm-hmm. And so they seem to kind of keep a connection with the wizarding world, but they're not really in it. Mm-hmm. So I am curious about how they get educated. 
Um, I think in the book, there's there's a scene where they say that normally squibs get sent to muggle schools and kind of integrated with the muggle community. Mm -hmm. um, because I guess what else do you do with them? Like, is there a way to educate them in the wizarding world? Apparently not. Apparently not, right? So, so clearly... Clearly, in some ways, when we're talking about Harry Potter, there's just a lack of options. There's a lack of choices. Yeah, yeah. A lot of lack of choices for yeah. people. Uh, that's very interesting. So when you think also about, let's talk about Ron for a second, because, okay. you know, Ronald Weasley. Um, <laughs> so do you think Ron uh, knew what he wanted to do or knew what he chose or knew, knew what he was thinking? I mean, I guess the point of, you know, maybe a care compared to the, they say school choice um, leaves some behind. Okay. Right? So mm -hmm. let's say the sorting hat is the sort of the, the government-run school system to choose her, right? <laughs> okay. And Ron was the one left behind because he didn't really make a choice like Harry. But what yeah. happened to Ron as a result of, of being uh, selected to go to Gryffindor, right? He, his life was totally different, right? And so I yeah. guess there are there benefits from to those who haven't made a choice. What are the benefits to those who don't actually make choices in, in the book? And mm -hmm. when, where do they get to make choices? At what point? I mean – the whole series is about character development and everybody making choices about who they want to be. And Ron, that all comes to a head for Ron in, in Deathly Hallows where he decides, you know, do I want to keep basically, you know, playing a good supporting character to Harry Potter mm -hmm. or do I want to just opt out of all of this? And he ultimately, you know, decides in favor of loyalty, which makes him a good Gryffindor. After he opted out, though. After he opted out. <laughs> and, well, you know, yeah, he's a teenager. He's in crisis. He opted out and he came back and saved the day. He he certainly did come back and save so the day. So I would say that, you know, based on that and like Gryffindor's sword appears for him like it did for Harry, that's all mm. confirmation that, oh yeah, Gryffindor was a good fit for Ron. So, I mean, this is like downstream benefits, right? So there's this argument that so by being around people who are making choices and who are belonging, people get, uh, everyone gets to benefit. So this is the idea of school sure. choice benefiting everyone in society. Sure. So the more you have options, the better society can be in the long haul because people will vote more. And we know this from our research, right? Parents will vote more. They'll get more involved in their community. They'll get more, more involved in their schools. And so um, I, th I think it's not necessarily an intentional part of the book, but I think there's this whole, whole sort of conversation about downstream benefits from belonging and choice. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you see it with the, the triad, right? They all kind of help each other. I mean, really, Hermione should have been a Ravenclaw. Like, we should have claimed Hermione. She's... <laughs> Definitely more of a Ravenclaw than a Gryffindor, I would argue, any day of the week. However, she needed they Ron and Harry needed her, so maybe the Sorting Hat had some prescience there. Like, hey, they they need somebody who's going to keep them on track. Well, it's also artistic license, right? So <laughs> the books need that. So, <laughs> so how else does Harry Potter sort of fit into the school choice world in your mind? Hmm. Are there other ways it fits in? I'm, you know, I'm kind of curious about what they do, and there might be some information about this. There's all kinds of, you know, background information on Pottermore and wherever. I'm kind of curious about what they do for, like, Wizarding Primary School. Because obviously they all come in at 11, and they know how to read. Like, they know the basics of reading and figuring because we don't see much of any of that happening in, in Wizarding School. They're learning about specifically magic things. So I'm kind of curious what that looks like like do they have options do they just send their kids to muggle school and hope they don't blow up the building accidentally one day <laughs> or where did Voldemort come from right Voldemort right. was in a uh, uh, as I recall was he in a he uh, in, foster care he was home. in an was orphanage, a, orphanage. Yeah. yeah so he was in a situation where he was not being educated and he was blowing up their things right yes yes right? it was a was really bad situation things. hey so what about the yellow bus system of Hogwarts otherwise known as the train on on platform nine and three quarters Right, so there's no other. So this is very interesting to come to. One of the criticisms made of school choice is there's there's no transportation. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Or if there is transportation, it's the yellow bus system, right? It's the yeah. school bus system. In this case of Hogwarts, it's only it's only the uh, the train. That's interesting, and it only presumably stops in London. Correct. There's got to be. I bet that I bet that there are other ways to get. There are other ways, and what are those other ways that Harry Potter had to get to the school? Well, I mean, the boys steal a car and get in illicitly. They scare, steal a car, that's one, but there's I've... another one. How do they get back and forth on the animals they can't see? Oh, yeah, they take the Thestrals at one point. That's right. But that's also like an, uh, flying under the radar. They're not supposed to do that. There's got to be other legitimate ways to get there. Like, what if you don't live near London? I don't know. I mean, it's I guess England is relatively small. Like, I'm thinking about this in my... Like American it's in wizarding context, world, you could just you know, disapparate if you're good enough as a wizard, right? You could just apparate so. somewhere close to London yes. and then put your kids on the train. That's yeah. true. That would be. Really or they have exciting. actually apparition stations, don't they? Or just apparition yeah, stations? Yeah, there are some. There are some close to 
Well, well they, I thought they, the transportation issue to school was an interesting one, right? So yeah. If you if you missed if you missed the, miss the train, literally, which they do at some point, you yeah. gotta you gotta yeah. steal a car, right? yep. so yep. or ride a Thestral. Yeah, that's. I'm trying to think. They wrote it out of Hogwarts. I they think wrote out of Hogwarts in, in before they go to the ministry. Before they go before to the, the battle of the that's ministry. Right. That's yeah. right. So this is, it just struck me as I was thinking about the train. Yeah. The only way in. Yeah. And of course, the only way in for um, the the Romanian school uh, is the ship. Yeah, it seems to be. <laughs> right. Right. So, it seems to be. All right. So school choice. So Harry's now at school. Uh, he's been sorted into Gryffindor. And does he ever want to get out? Does he ever want to go not to school, not to be in Gryffindor? What? Is there any point where he says, "I don't want. I don't like my choice anymore." Do you ever think about moving? Um, I don't think he ever thinks about moving to a different house. I think that there are, are all there are these continuous questions of do I belong here? Do I really belong here? But those keep getting affirmed. I mean, we see, you know, um, my daughter and I just started Chamber of Secrets last night, actually. We only read the first chapter, but, you know, in Chamber of Secrets, he pulls he pulls Gryffindor's sword out of the sorting hat, confirming that, yes, you belong here. And that continues to happen. And I think it's always that war between Harry as he is and Harry as a horcrux. There's always that piece mm-hmm. of Voldemort and when he kind of comes out with those more Slytherin qualities, he himself questions, are, are you sure? Should you I really sure? be here? Yeah. Should I be in Slytherin? At some point he rejects the school though, right? He goes, he leaves. Oh right? yeah, he leaves school altogether. He says, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going to come back for my final year. I'm leaving. Yeah. And, and yet that, that decision to take that actually was what ended up saving the school in the long run. One saving would think. the whole world. Saving one could argue the whole wizarding world. Yes. I would say the whole world. Voldemort's <laughs> destroying muggles left and right, too. So. Fair enough. Harry Potter saves the world. Harry Potter. Well, it wasn't just Harry. Let's give Hermione <laughs> and Ron and, and, <laughs> and, and, and let's give uh, uh, our Neville. wonderful elf. You know, and Neville. Oh, yes. Neville you know? Longbottom. Yeah. No. Neville is like the key. I think he's the key character for showing that you get sorted into a house based on who you want to become, not on who you are. Because he... Clearly should have been a Hufflepuff. Like, ha- he has the most in common with uh, the Hufflepuff head of house who runs the uh, the greenhouse. That's right. You know, but he becomes he becomes a Gryffindor. He too pulls Godric Gryffindor's hat or he, he sword does. out of the hat, and he saves Harry certainly in the in the Triwizarding Cup on with his uh, Gillyweed. And that's uh, true. Yes, even though he was given a little help there. Yes, that's true. Um, but I, I think the characters like of, of Neville, and then I think of Dobby. Dobby's mm-hmm. uneducated. He's an uneducated health, it's right? It's true. You have this whole not, this whole argument about these magical but non-human, non-wizard creatures. Non, non-school, as yes. it were. Non-typically yes. schooled, and yet, yet, yet seemingly learned. Right? Yeah, so if you look yeah. at Dobby, Do- Dobby and elves are extremely magical creatures. Yes. Right? They don't formally go to formal school. Right. And yet they seem to that be learned in wizardry or in magic. Yeah, I wonder if it's more instinctual. But even the like even the basics, he seems to be able to read. Correct. At least. Well, everyone who's a Gringotts, right? All the all the folks. All the goblins. There's gotta be like this whole other education system for goblins. They basically learn accounting. That's right. So there's gotta be another (laughs) learning system, right? Yeah. It's it's not just there. So there's an interesting there's a human uh, wizarding school and and what about Hmm, the other wizarding learning areas, right? I guess we're left to postulate about those. Right, right. How they learn. Yeah. I think I think there are some hints that wizards also learn at school a little bit before they go. They typically are homeschooled, I think, before. Interesting. Wizard think, is homeschoolers. I think so. All right. So I want to go back to Harry Potter, like, dropping out. Harry Potter is a dropout. He is a high school dropout. He's a high school it's dropout, true. right? <laughs> um, was that okay? Was that the right thing for him to do? Did he learn? Did he Did he have a good quality of life? I mean, did, did he not? I mean, in our modern world, school choice, he should be forced to go on this sort of a progression, this linear progression. Sure. Grade school, high school, college. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was obviously the right choice because, A, he saved the entire world, as I've already said, because Voldemort would have taken over everything and it would have been terrible. Um, but also we know from The Cursed Child. I don't, have you read The Cursed Child? Oh, hold on. I have to step back for a second. Okay. I, just because Voldemort would have tried to kill Muggles doesn't mean Muggles would have killed him back because if you look at Fantastic Beasts, it looks like they're really scared of humans. And humans killing them. Mm, all right. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily count the muggles out here in a war against Voldemort, but, but let's move on. <laughs> all right. You know, have you read Standing Cursed up Child? for the muggle. No, I haven't read that okay. yet. So. Well, it, so it's it's a post story. It's about Harry's, one of Harry's sons, right? Yes. So it, it takes us way Best far in the future. friends with Malfoy's son, I understand. Ye- Good friends with yes. Malfoy's son. That's right, isn't it? Sorry, I'm totally referencing off camera. It's been a minute since I've read it. So I'll have to read it again. Yes, I'll have to start right, reading it, but I've heard it. It's really good. It's it's a fun read. It's totally different because it's a play. 
Um, anyway, we know from that that Harry becomes an R, which is what he's always wanted to do, what he wanted to do in high school. But they told him he couldn't because his potion scores weren't good enough. Okay. Remember that? I do remember that. And so that. clearly he has this successful life. Like, he's got a wife and kids and is doing great things. I mean, Hermione's a dropout, too. I would... I would venture a guess that Hermione probably went back and crossed the T's and dotted so, the I's, but we don't know that. Actually, let's let's talk. This is really interesting now because I'm getting – so Hermione probably finished well before she actually progressed linearly. She probably had the number of credits for, and that's, the quality of her test scores probably true. to have been finished probably in her third year. Yeah, that's probably right? true. I yeah. mean, heck, the one year she, she spent in 18 different classes using the timepiece, she probably <laughs> graduated then, right? Yeah, so, I mean, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So So Harry's a dropout, but that was okay. But that was okay. You know who else leaves early? Um, the Weasley twins the Weasley leave twins. early and start yeah. a wildly successful business. Like it would have been silly for them to stay an extra year. I mean, their mom's furious when they drop out, but they're the most successful Weasleys, arguably. So this is really interesting when you look at Harry Potter and School Choice. There are multiple pathways as you get past a min- minimum level of education. Sure. Right. So, and none of those pathways are judged to be bad. Well, I mean, I think the Some are adults, more challenging than others. I think the adults in the situation would say that not taking the traditional pathway is bad, but it ultimately doesn't turn out that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, Mrs. Weasley is really upset when Fred and George leave early that she thinks that they shouldn't have done that, but then they go on and found their successful business, and all of the adults in Harry, Ron, and Hermione's lives are saying, you really need to stay in school, which... Let's be honest, if my kid were going up against a dark lord of magic, I would be saying the same sure. thing. Like, please don't do this. Please don't do this. However. <laughs> so, so yeah, the, the adults are mad at the Weasley brothers, right? Right. Um, no one's really mad at Harry when he drops out. No, drops they are. Out. They just can't find him. They didn't. True. I mean, they argued against him doing it. Just nobody can find him. Fair point. But he drops out. He goes through a trial and he comes back and he doesn't go back to school. He doesn't finish as far Not as Not that know. we know of. Right. So there, there are other pathways to successful societies and successful lives. It's true. Than, than merely completing a formalized education. Right, right. Um, uh, and so I think that's a really interesting part about Harry Potter, right? So you know Hermione obviously had enough credits to finish, right? Right. You just know that, right? Yeah. Uh, and Ron, I assume. Ron and Harry work together. At, like they As an aura, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they're they doing good things as adults. Okay. They probably didn't go back and finish because they're just not those So Ron's the classic C student? Is that what we're saying here? Yeah. I think Ron just needed to find his motivation, right? Like he's the, I, yeah, I would say he's the classic sort of coasting student. He's just going to kind of, you know, go and mm-hmm. do what he absolutely has to to get by. But be successful anyway. Yeah. Right? I think it's interesting. I think it's one of the interesting things that, that Harry Potter in this conversation makes me think about is the limits of education mm, in yeah. terms of in terms of how the limits let me not the limits of education, the limits of school buildings. The limits of formalized sure, school. Sure. Right. I don't think anyone stopped learning or stopped getting educated as they right. went past as they got out of the school building. Yeah, well and yeah, and that's kind of interesting to talk about with Harry too, because of his career choice. Like he is fighting Dark magic, that's what he decides to go and do. And you can look back and he had maybe one, maybe two good defense against the dark arts professors. Like most of his experience that he would probably be using on his job as an adult didn't come from his formal education because defense against the dark arts was Was always where the Voldemort people went. Inconsistent and pretty terrible. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Right? So all of his, I mean, the stuff that he's using in his everyday job is really from his experience in That's life right. and one well, is one Voldemort. teaching experience remember when a, oh there's a whole nother conversation about school choice so harry potter became a teacher for a while in the middle of school he became oh, a yeah. peer teacher right he did so become a peer teacher. he taught the dark art defensive arts the dark arts himself yes uh, uh against uh madam uh what was her name mrs uh, the pink lady, lady. Pink. pink lady oh i can't stand her Miss umbridge. dolores umbridge dolores umbridge she is absolutely the worst. By the way, in Britain, do you know what umbrage means? No. To take umbrage? Oh, yeah. It means to, you're, be, you're offended, to be, right? be offended, right? So yeah. she basically, her whole name was offensive. <laughs> she was just the worst. Like, I know a well-acted character when I just hate them every time they come on screen. Oh, yeah. And I hate her more than I hate Voldemort. She is just a terrible person. I shall not tell a lie. Yes. Oh, there you want to talk about regulations in schools and how over-regulating there, can cause problems. There we Dolores go. Dolores Umbridge right there. So Dolores <laughs> Umbridge is the problem with over-regulating public schools right there, right? <laughs> um, it becomes... In fact, that's a great scene. Remember how um, 
they start by tacking one rule up on the yes, wall, yes. and then Filch is ending up in this ladder that's it's like, like this nineteen whole wall freaking of, miles yeah. long, and, yeah. and it's all these regulations, and no one knows uh, yep. how to act and behave. Yeah, and, and they particularly try to regulate the defense against the dark arts classes because they're completely, you know, that's correct. shutting out what's going on in the world around them. Like, that's oh, maybe our students actually do know how to need to know how to defend. Themselves. So it's interesting. So, like, uh, some argue that our schools do not prepare kids for work. And, yeah. and and for jobs and sure. jobs in the 21st century. So in a way, that's exactly what Dolores is doing by stopping the defense against the dark arts. Yeah. Basically, hey, we don't care if you need a million new jobs in I don't know healthcare industry. Right. We're going to go ahead and just sort of ignore that and teach this way. Yeah, yeah. And it's very interesting how that that works. And and what happened to all those rules in the end? They all fell off the wall when Fred and George left. That's one of my favorite scenes. It's a great I love scene. that scene. It's a very good scene. <laughs> all the regulations were were upended and destroyed. Yeah, and they found ways around them, too. I think that's that's kind of an interesting, like, if you put enough pressure on a system, then you're going to end up creating maybe systems that you don't want. I mean, that's why Harry becomes a pure teacher, right? right, is because they're not learning anything in Defense Against the Dark Arts, and he says, all right, you need to at least know how to disarm someone. So that's really interesting. So so the actual regulations and the top-down the top down control leads to a school within a school. Yeah. To lead to within new ideas and new entrepreneurial ways of educating kids. <laughs> yeah. That is interesting. Interesting. That's very cool. L- let's talk a little bit about the end of the book. Mm-hmm. Right. So Harry Potter has, when we started this conversation, Harry Potter uh, was going to school. Right. And was unsure of what, what he wanted, what house he wanted to be in. In fact, chose his house through his sorting hat. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, Harry Potter's a dropout <laughs> uh, or Harry Potter's a teacher, Right. Uh, and we talked about uh, how schools within schools look like. And so there's all this sort of continuum of sort of discussion about educational choice and, and education throughout sort of Harry Potter books. Now we get to the last scene in the last book. What happened there? They all bring their kids back and put them on the train to go to Hogwarts for the So that gives you chills, right? So now all of a sudden the circle comes back. And, and why do you think they chose to do that? Well, I mean, they have great connections, obviously. Well, from what we've talked about, they may not have other choices to educate their kids in magic unless maybe they homeschool. That might be a thing. But um, but they all have good memories of their time at Hogwarts. They obviously yeah, so found what it really were the valuable. options? Yeah, so what were the uh, what? Let's just think about this for a second differently. What were the options that Harry Potter had for his kid to educate? I guess homeschooling? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I suppose homeschooling? you could send them to a school in another country, but that seems like kind of a stretch. So you could have sent them to the Romanian school or, right. or, or uh, I guess he couldn't send him to the, the all female school. Um, yes, probably not. Uh, but he could have sent him to another wizarding school. He, I guess he could have educated him in a Muggle school. Um, <laughs> he could have nice. he could have homeschooled, right? right. Uh, but he chose Hogwarts, right? So, uh, uh, and I think that's that comes back to that sense of belonging. Yeah, right? for sure. And I think that's part of the conversation about education and educational choice in America. You know. The idea that that education has cr- creates a sense of belonging, and this is when you, and when you choose, you feel even more connected to stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So maybe it's really interesting in the power of choice creating um, that sort of familial and generational um, opportunity. Yeah, I like that. So as Harry Potter is is bringing his kids to school, uh, and and it's interesting what happens to his kids, right? What happens to his son? Well, Albus Severus gets sorted into. Um, we find out later that he becomes a Slytherin, and that was maybe not expected, but Harry tells him, you know, it's okay if you're a Slytherin. One of the bravest men I ever knew was a Slytherin, and you're named after him, obviously Severus Snape. And um, I think that's really cool to to see that Hogwarts has sort of the, that school within a school. There's choices within, you know, maybe they don't have a lot of good, viable options to educate their kids outside of Hogwarts, but within that, there's, you know, these four different kind of personalities of ways to educate kids or ways that they can belong to a community and they see the value in giving kids those options and saying, you know, wherever you fit in, that's okay. So that's right. So I think you, you said it best. It's like uh, Hogwarts is like a microcosm of school choice, right? So yeah. And so you have all these options and maybe Harry is saying to his son, it, it's okay to get in where you fit in yeah. because choice is a good thing, yep. right? So, so in the end, Harry Potter is ultimately a, a tale of choice and opportunity a, a tale of belonging and 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 freedom, a, a tale of of education, not building, yeah. of learning, not not school, yeah. And it's, so this interesting sort of of uh, discussion about how Harry goes from being in a school to being a leader. I mean, 
I just love the fact he was a dropout that became did well. And, <laughs> right. And some of the characters, all of them dropped out ostensibly in a some ways. A lot of them did, yeah. Um, and the Weasley brothers created this incredible store and are successful entrepreneurs. And so, but the importance of education to get them a platform to jump off of. Yeah. So I think that's what's amazing about Harry Potter. You know, I hope we have more Harry Potter conversations with different members <laughs> of staff because, as you great. said, we have. A lot of people in here <laughs> um, who want to talk about this. In fact, one of them wants to talk about the injustice of uh, having to buy uh, cauldrons and, and wands and, and all these <laughs> school, expenses. school fees, That's a big right? deal. Yeah. School fees. But so, so we're going to hopefully do more of these uh, on Ed Choice Chats. And obviously, we want your ideas as well. So if you guys uh, want to send ideas about pop culture and, and school choice, uh, email us at media at edchoice.org. Obviously, we want you to to get uh, in touch with us and subscribe to everything we we have. So subscribe to our podcast on SoundCloud, on iTunes, and Stitcher. Follow us on social media, which the Twitter is at EdChoice, or obviously the old-fashioned way now, our, our at Edge, or www.edchoice.org. Oh, my God, I even said www. No one says that anymore. <laughs> you know? So so EdChoice.org or Twitter or Facebook, we're, all, we're on all the platforms. We'd love to see people there. Thanks again for having us on another version of Ed Choice Chats.